The programs regularly scheduled at this time will not be seen today so that we may bring you coverage of the flight of Gemini. NBC News presents the flight of Gemini 7, the beginning of the longest space mission ever attempted by man. This special NBC News report is brought to you by the Gulf Oil Corporation, producers of more and better energy from oil. Now reporting from the NBC News Space Center, here are Chet Huntley and David Brinkley. Good afternoon. In the course of this uh, double mission, you might get a little confused. That possibility applies to us as well. T minus eight minutes and counting on the Gemini 7 mission. We have just gone past one of our major milestones uh, during the final pages, phases of the countdown. That is at the seven or eight minute mark when we make our final check of all elements in the countdown to ensure that we are in a go condition. In the countdown manual itself, we asked for a green light and we did receive a green light from all elements as they reported pro. All systems still going very well. Our winds in the launch area have picked up a little bit to about 10 knots However, that is not expected to have any effect on the mission or any effect on the condition of the pad following launch. We're now at T minus seven minutes and 14 seconds and counting. This is Gemini Launch Control. The voice of Jack King at Gemini Launch Control here. Of course, the main Gemini Control is uh, in Houston at the Mission Control Center, where the voice of Paul Haney will be coming up uh, periodically to keep us posted on how the flight of Gemini 7 is going. Russ, Russ Jay, the main is thing that's happening here at, the point, at this moment is these, this full status report we... Uh... Russ, Jay, this is Kaplo again. I believe shortly after the launch, about six minutes into the flight, we will be moving into one of the, uh, up to this point, relatively untried phases of a flight. The uh, spacecraft carrying Borman and Lovell will actually try to station keep and uh, maneuver with respect to its trailing booster section. I think it pulls away at a two to three feet a second and uh, goes through a period of about 25 minutes where they actually try to keep some sort of uh, visual contact with the trailing section of the booster. We saw evidence of some of the station, uh, station keeping once before and it didn't quite work out. Uh, that was on GT4, was it, Herb? Uh, I can't think back that far. <laughs> the whole space program was mushed together for me at <laughs> this point. But, what uh, was that, Jake? That was Gemini 4 with uh, McDivitt and White, and they gave up after one orbit. Of course, we had the rendezvous pod on Gemini 5, and shortly after that was ejected uh, for a uh, rendezvous attempt. We had the problem that occurred in the fuel cell system, and I do point out system, not the fuel cell. Well, if they the are able to pull out. off this attempt to watch and... Uh, follow along, or actually they'll lead the, uh, the uh, section of the booster, uh, they will have to abandon it if they don't achieve a proper orbit. Okay. Uh, Herb, uh, we'll interrupt here and just briefly. We're now uh, five minutes from launch, and we are going to go back to Gemini Launch Control here uh, at Cape Kennedy for a late status report. Let's pick that up. This is Gemini Launch Control, T-minus five minutes and counting, T-minus five. We have just completed another status check at the four or five and a half minute mark in the countdown. This is a communications check of all elements. This also came out in a go condition. Everything's still looking good as we primarily in the blockhouse monitor functions at this time while the automatic sequencer for the launch vehicle does most of the work. There are several more manual functions that will be conducted, but we're primarily monitoring at this point. Astronaut Frank Borman and Jim Lovell reporting from the spacecraft that all is going well within the Gemini 7 spacecraft. Now T-minus four minutes and 20 seconds and counting. This is Gemini Launch Control. That was Jack King at the Gemini Launch Control here as the countdown continues real smoothly. At this point, all has been uh, given the go-ahead. Uh, we have heard from Chris Kraft, all the systems in the rocket, in the spacecraft, everything here is ready. So in about four minutes, Gemini 7 should be on its way to begin the flight here from Cape Kennedy, which will take it 206 
trips around Earth if there's no hitches, and just shy, shy about six hours shy, that is, of uh, uh, 14 days in space. Of course, the all-important rendezvous mission by Gemini 6, the next nine days will be spent here to get it ready to lift off of the pad here uh, from Cape Kennedy. And of course, uh, if all goes well, it will be the first time that this nation has had two spacecraft in orbit manned at the same time and will be man's first rendezvous. This comes two years and four months short of the uh, first two man ship, which were the Vostoks three and four by the Russians. We are now uh, three minutes and counting. We're going to switch back over to Gemini Control and for another progress report from this Jack Gemini King. Launch Control, T minus three minutes and counting, T minus three. Everything's still looking good from the blockhouse and at the Mission Control Center in Houston at the present time as we continue our final checks of both the launch vehicle and spacecraft. Some final guidance checks with the launch vehicle are going on at the present time. We are still getting good reports and we have the green lights on in the console. Everything is looking good, T minus two minutes and 33 seconds and counting. There you are, we're in the final three minutes of the countdown as the Gemini Titan's guidance system has given its commands to fly the astronauts to a point 100 miles above the Atlantic where the Gemini 7 will begin the first of what is hoped to be more than 200 trips around Earth. If all goes according to the flight plan, astronauts Frank Borman and James Lovell will set a new space endurance record just short of 14 days in space. And if their launch is successful, they will should become the target of the Gemini 6 spacecraft scheduled to be piloted from here by astronauts Wally Shira and Tom Stafford in nine days. The two spacecraft will fly in formation through orbit after Gemini 6 conducts, to conducts man's first rendezvous in space. A successful endurance and rendezvous mission by the four astronauts will confirm space planners have adopted a good plan to place two Americans on the moon before the end of the decade. Now back to Gemini Control. Conditions still looking good. Now T minus 90 seconds and counting, T minus 90 seconds and counting. As we proceed down to the final moments of the countdown, the launch vehicle, first stage engines will ignite and build up some 430,000 pounds of thrust. When 77% of this thrust is reached, the launch vehicle is released from the pad. All this takes a matter of seconds, some two and a half to three seconds. That's Jiminy uh, control. One minute and counting. T minus one minute and counting. Jack King, now we go up to Russ Ward on our observation balcony. Jay, the, uh, luckily, luckily the rain has stopped, but it's quite breezy up here where we are right now. We have a beautiful view of the rocket over on pad 19, the umbilical tower next to it. You down into the engine compartment will be open. T minus 30 seconds and counting. 30 seconds away from lunch. There is 25. There is a full cloud cover overhead, but it's T a high ceiling. 20. Approaching the dramatic final 10 seconds 15. of the countdown. Quite breezy now. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, zero. Ignition. Engine start. We have a liftoff at 30 minutes and about five seconds after the hour. There it goes. The orange flame now. Plus clearly seconds. visible. The huge orange cloud of smoke around the launch pad. You can hear the roar Three from the rocket. And there it goes. Slowly climbing. Looking good at 20 seconds. It is now about half a mile high. The rocket now starts the pitch program. There's the pitch program to put it in the right attitude for a good orbit. It's now out over the Atlantic Ocean, still climbing. A beautiful picture, clearly visible. The bright plane, still visible. Climbing toward that 11,000 foot cloud cover, still climbing. About three miles high now, both astronauts have now released the D-rank. Now four and a half miles high, a mile down range, now moving about 700 miles an hour. Seven and a half miles high now. It's now in what is called Max Q. This is the 
highest aerodynamic pressure. Still looks good. Dr. Berry is go. About 12 miles high. One minute, 30 seconds. Six miles downrange. 15 miles high now, about 10 miles downrange. It's now in what is called... One minute, 40 seconds, thrust very slightly low, as much as uh, only about 2% low, quite acceptable. It's now in what is called abort mode 2. The flyers now would separate the spacecraft from the rocket before... Coming up on two minutes. ...before making a premature launch. Mark we, two minutes. We could barely see... Our velocity is 3,600 miles per hour. The G-force is 3.3. We could barely see... The crew reports their go for staging, which should occur in a very few seconds. We could barely see the photographic planes as they tracked the liftoff. We could see their contrails, but the planes themselves... The high above the says looks good for staging. About 40 miles high now. Two minutes, 30 seconds. That last burst you heard the tracking planes breaking the sound barrier. We should have had staging by now. We've got staging. staging, stage two thrust looks good. At this point, the astronauts will be checking minutes, here to make sure seconds. that the guidance system on the Titan second stage is kicked in as scheduled. Foreman reports the radio guidance system has locked on at three minutes into the flight. That's the voice of Paul Haney at Mission Control confirming the guidance Rossi system has locked 100 on. 100 miles per hour. The rocket now, some 60 miles high, traveling perhaps 7,500 miles an hour now as it starts this two-week voyage.